Hey there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Morgan Radford in for Alice Morris. You're watching NBC News Now, and here's what's happening. President Biden's been very clear that he remains committed to a two-state solution. Antony Blinken is heading to the Middle East as the Biden administration stands firm on its commitment to a two-state solution. Meanwhile, the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas is holding for a fourth day, but the situation there is still very fragile. We're on the ground in Tel Aviv. Plus, one year since George Floyd's murder, where does police reform actually stand in Congress? Lawmakers are facing a deadline from President Biden, and we will have the latest for you from Capitol Hill. We start now with the tension in the Middle East, where we find NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin for us there in Tel Aviv. Aaron, thanks for being with us. We know that President Biden announced just this morning that Secretary of State Antony Blinken is, in fact, heading to the Middle East amid all of this turmoil. So, Aaron, what's on the agenda once he touches down? What is he hoping to accomplish? Well, the primary agenda of the Secretary of State remains twofold. First, to make sure the ceasefire is strengthened and holds, and then also to make sure that aid gets to Gaza. Gaza is facing a humanitarian crisis right now with a crumbling health system, tens of thousands of Palestinians without homes. It is a desperate situation, and it's one that the Secretary of State plans to address on this visit. Take a listen. That has to start now with dealing with the, uh, the grave humanitarian situation uh, in Gaza, uh, then uh, reconstruction, uh, rebuilding what's, what's been lost, and critically, uh, engaging both sides in trying to um, start to make real improvements in, um, uh, in the lives of, of people so that Israelis and Palestinians can live with equal measures of security, uh, of peace, and of dignity. A potentially complicating factor in getting that badly needed aid to Gaza is, of course, Hamas. Hamas remains the primary power there, political power there in Gaza. And there are some concerns about getting aid to that area will then simply go to Hamas, will simply use it to rearm itself. A senior State Department official uh, earlier today in a briefing was asked about that, acknowledging that that is, in fact, a concern, saying that the United States is going to be working with the United Nations as well as the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah to try and make sure that does not happen, uh, but noting that there are no guarantees. Morning. And Aaron, just before we let you go, the ceasefire does appear to be holding for the time being, but both Israel and Hamas, as you mentioned earlier, are claiming victory. So what are both sides saying right now? Yeah, it does appear to be holding not a single missile uh, launched, rocket launched or airstrike in the past four days. Um, a, a senior Hamas leader telling our sister station Sky News that uh, this this leader believes it's not in neither Israel nor Hamas's interest to have anything escalate further. And we did hear from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu threaten Hamas uh, with ex extreme force should Hamas break the ceasefire. But as for the situation in Jerusalem, uh, we were there over the weekend. It was extremely tense, heavy security presence, uh, Israeli police inside the old city, as well as in East Jerusalem. Just today, uh, a Palestinian man was shot and killed, according to Israeli police, for attacking two Israelis in near the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem. And it was that same neighborhood that we saw clashes on Saturday between Palestinian protesters and police. And on Friday, we saw clashes unfolding at the Al-Aqsa compound itself. So the situation is fragile and tense. Speaking to both Israelis and Palestinians, you definitely get the sense that both sides are bracing for the possibility of more violence. Morgan. All right. Aaron McLaughlin Flores there in Tel Aviv. Aaron, thank you for being there. And President Biden is condemning the recent rise in anti-Semitic attacks across the U.S. amid the conflict that's happening there between Israel and Hamas. And he, in fact, he said earlier today on Twitter that the despicable acts must stop. NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece is here with us now just outside the White House. 
Shannon, the president's condemnation came after the Anti-Defamation League and other Jewish groups sent him this letter on Friday. I want to pull it up for you here. It notes those recent attacks in several states across the country. And the White House is now working with community groups to really respond to that. What exactly is the White House doing on this front, Shannon? Well, you mentioned that very strong statement from the president today who came out on Twitter saying that the recent attacks on the Jewish community are despicable and they must stop. I condemn this hateful behavior at home and abroad. It is up to all of us to give hate no safe harbor. We heard similarly strong statements from a number of other administration officials, uh, including domestic policy advisor Susan Rice. Um, And as you mentioned, there are these Jewish groups that the White House says it is now working with after receiving the letter. And this idea of combating hate has become a bit of a theme of this administration, sadly. Uh, It was just on Friday the White House had a number of senators, Republicans and Democrats to the White House for the signing of the Asian American hate crimes bill that arose out of this wave of hate crimes following the COVID pandemic. So it is something that the president has been speaking out about and continues to speak out about uh, as there just seems to be no end to all these hate crimes we're seeing in America. Uh, You know, also, Shannon, we're seeing that Secretary of State Antony Blinken says that President Biden is, in fact, committed to a two-state solution there. Uh, Here's part of his interview on ABC's this week. Take a listen to this first. President Biden's been very clear that he uh, remains committed to a two-state solution. Look, ultimately, it is the only way to ensure Israel's future as a Jewish and democratic state, and of course, the only way to give the Palestinians the state to which uh, they're entitled. That's where uh, we have to go. But that I don't think is something for uh, necessarily for today. Um, we have to start putting in place the conditions that would allow uh, both sides to engage in a, in a, in a meaningful and positive way uh, toward two states. And Shannon, we just heard a moment ago from Aaron McLaughlin, who is there in Tel Aviv, describing the fact that Secretary Blinken is leaving today for Israel. But what do we know about his trip specifically? Well, this will be his first trip to the region. And this trip was scheduled, was put in place in response to the conflict. Within the White House and the administration, the Middle East has not been the top priority um, when it comes to foreign policy. It has been China primarily, Asia uh, and Russia to some extent. Uh, The Middle East, though, obviously greatly elevated after that 11-day conflict. And you can see that by the Secretary of State going there to visit. He will be meeting with not only the Israelis, but the Palestinians. Palestinians also. I, that is notable because um, for most of the Trump administration, after the early days, there was really no communication between the Trump administration and the Palestinians. They, for the most part, were left out of talk. So that notable. He will also be making stops um, in Jordan and in Egypt. And another two partners who were crucial in trying to get that peace, uh, this ceasefire through. But as you could hear in that soundbite, they are not talking about any grand plan. This is not the Trump administration talking about Jared Kushner brokering peace in the Middle East. They are looking for incremental steps, making sure this ceasefire holds and starting to lay the groundwork again um, after so much um, you know, turmoil uh, over the past two weeks on both sides. Groundwork, we hope, for long-lasting peace. Shannon Pettipe's for us there in D.C. Thank you so much. The Senate could take up the January 6th commission bill as soon as this week, and there appears to be pretty broad public support. In fact, 64 percent of Americans agree with creating a bipartisan commission to really investigate the attacks at the Capitol. Now, those are just the latest numbers from a survey monkey Axios poll, and that also includes 55 percent of moderate Republicans. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins me now from Capitol Hill. Uh, Leanne, public support is one thing, but what about Republicans there in the Senate? I mean, are you hearing any really firm support for this bill from senators or is it pretty much dead? Republican support, Morgan, in the Senate does not mirror what we're seeing in polling like that around the country where public support does want to see some sort of investigation and perhaps an independent commission to investigate January 6th. There are most Republicans in the Senate who have already come out against the commission. They made that determination after Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell came out last week also saying he was opposed. There's a small number of Senate Republicans who 
say that they are trying to get to yes, perhaps open to supporting it, including us the usual suspects, really, Senator Susan Collins of Maine, Mitt Romney of Utah, perhaps Senator Lisa Murkowski, or yeah, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. But one Senate Republican who voted to impeach the former president because of January 6th, Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina, already says that he doesn't support it. So it is going to be very difficult for the Democrats to find 10 Republicans to join them in order for this to pass. Of course, we'll see how this process plays out once it finally does come to the floor for a vote. But uh, the way it looks now, Morgan, it looks like the Republicans are not interested in this point in any sort of commission to find out what happened on that day. And Leanne, let's also switch gears for a minute and talk about police reform, because we all know that tomorrow was President Biden's deadline that he gave Congress to really figure this out yeah. by the one year anniversary of George Floyd's killing. But negotiations there are still at a standstill. So frankly, Leanne, what is the holdup? Well, it's complicated. Um, the good thing is, is that all of the negotiators are still talking. All of the negotiators are saying that there is good progress and all the negotiators are not leaking what is actually happening in those negotiations. And up here on Capitol Hill, that's actually a good sign that things are progressing. Once we start to get lots of leaks about what is happening behind those closed doors, that's a sign that things are in fact falling apart. But some of the issues remain are the same issues that have been plaguing negotiators for a while, including this idea of qualified immunity, which is, um, you know, financial and civil accountability of individual police officers uh, should there be misconduct in the field. Currently, there is a shield protecting police officers, so they cannot be held personally liable. Let's listen to what Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey, a Democrat, one of the main negotiators in this, uh, in this proposal, uh, what he said over the weekend about it. We need to, at some point, uh, get qualified immunity. It's what I'm determined at this negotiating table to get. This is not about going after good officers. This is about when officers have breached the civil rights of, a, of, a, of another American citizen. So as you heard there, Booker said he's still determined to ensure some changes regarding qualified immunity. So that is not something that has been settled among the negotiators. But I'm also told that it's not just that issue. There's a lot of issues and they all fit together. And it's a big, giant puzzle that they're trying to figure out. But I'm also told that this has to be done in the next few weeks um, because negotiators, if it's going to take months, they're just going to uh, uh, there will be no legislation. So we're talking weeks, not months. I'm told, um, but we're watching this closely, Morgan, to see where it ends up. Especially while people's lives are on the line. Uh, Leanne Caldwell for us there in Capitol Hill. Leanne, thank you for being with us. And former U.S. Ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sondland, is suing former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and the U.S. government. Sondland is seeking nearly $2 million in legal costs he accrued while serving as a witness in former President Trump's first impeachment investigation. Now, in the suit, Sondland alleges that Pompeo failed to actually follow through on a, quote, legally binding promise to reimburse him. NBC News justice correspondent Pete Williams joins me now from Washington, D.C. Pete, uh, that suit alleges that Pompeo and his staff continued to reaffirm his promise to reimburse Sondland. But what more can you tell us about that? So a little about Sondland, the background here. He's the one who, in dramatic televised testimony before Congress, talked about what he called a quid pro quo, namely that the Trump administration told Ukraine the U.S. would resume military aid if Ukraine would launch an investigation of an energy company which included Hunter Biden on its board of directors. So in the lawsuit, Sondland says he had no choice but to testify because he was served with a subpoena. And he says the State Department informed him that government lawyers would not represent him. But he says Mike Pompeo, who was secretary of state, and other senior officials told him at least four times that the government would reimburse him for the full cost that he incurred in hiring his own lawyers. Sondland says that all changed after his testimony when he was fired by Trump and Pompeo. He says the government offered to reimburse him just 86000 but he says his legal fees are more than 20 times that, $1.8 million. 
So he says Pompeo's repeated promises amount to a legally binding contract, which the government must honor. But he has an alternate alternate theory here, too. He says if Pompeo did not actually have the authority as secretary of state to make that commitment, then Pompeo was acting outside the scope of his office, which is fraud. And therefore, he says Pompeo should come up with the money out of his own pocket. Well, is it fraud, Pete? I mean, what is Pompeo saying about all of this? Well, Pompeo isn't saying much. I mean, he will at some point legally respond to it. He has responded to the lawsuit today by calling it ridiculous, saying he's confident the courts will see it the same way. One of Sondland's lawyers, by the way, says he harbors no ill will against Pompeo and is just seeking the reimbursement that he says he was promised. So Pompeo says this is ridiculous, but the complaint says that Sondland is, in fact, seeking a jury trial. So what can we expect next then? Well, the next thing is the the Pompeo's lawyers will respond. I suspect that they will seek to dismiss this. They'll they'll file a motion to dismiss. But a couple of civil lawyers I've talked to say they think it could well survive a motion to dismiss. You know, a, a, a contract does not have to be written down. An agreement doesn't have to be written down to be legally binding. And so I'm sure that some of these other people who Sondland argues in the lawsuit were witnesses and made their own statements about the government's promises, uh, witnesses to what was said at the time, will potentially be witnesses if there is a trial. So that's the next step. Pompeo's lawyers will respond. Well, we will wait to see. All right. Pete Williams for us there in D.C. Pete, as always, thank you. You bet. All right. All right. It is that time again. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce, who's following the latest headlines for us. Simone, tell us what is up. Hey, Morgan, great to see you on this Monday. We're going to start with this. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer apologizing after she was seen in a photo with a dozen people at a bar violating her own order, restricting indoor dining of more than six people at a table. Now, the governor saying she was dining with friends when more people arrived and tables got pushed together, adding that everyone was vaccinated. And most of the state's COVID restrictions are expected to be lifted on July 1st. Well, Kevin Spacey will make his return to acting in a low-budget indie film. Variety reporting Spacey will play a small role as a police detective in an Italian film directed by Franco Nero. Now, this will be the actor's first film following those sexual assault and misconduct allegations that came to light in 2017. And world powers condemning Belarus after the Eastern European nation used a fighter jet to force the landing of a commercial airliner. President Alexander Lukashenko ordered the Ryanair flight en route to Lithuania to land in Belarus's capital of Minsk in order to detain an opposition journalist who was on board. Now, Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying the U.S. and allies are demanding an international investigation. And 21 people died during an ultra marathon in northwestern China, sparking public outrage over the lack of emergency planning. Hail, freezing rain and gale force winds swept through the mountain terrain during the 60 mile race. Now, the government says they are promising a full investigation. And Phil Mickelson winning the PGA Championship yesterday, becoming the oldest major golf champion in history at age 50. Mickelson also became the first player in PGA Tour history to win tournaments 30 years apart and the 10th player to win majors in three decades. That is an elite status that was most recently held by Tiger Woods. Morgan, I'll send can it back to you. Can you even imagine? I mean, I would love to be that talented at that age in a major sport. That's incredible. Putting us all to shame, that's for sure. <laughs> Talk about multitasking. Love to see it. All right. Simone Boyce, thank you so much. We appreciate it. States all across the U.S. are coming up with these really creative incentives to get Americans vaccinated. But the question is, will it actually work? NBC News Now correspondent Isa Gutierrez has more. A $100 savings bond in West Virginia, a $10,000 scholarship in Lancaster, California, free beer in New Jersey, donuts from Krispy Kreme, Shake Shack fries in New York City. You just think of this when you think of vaccination. Mm. And a drink in Connecticut. 
In a push to encourage Americans to get their vaccine, governments and businesses across the country are thinking outside the box. Recently, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine capturing much national attention. For Ohio residents who get their shots, the state is offering something in return, a shot at winning $1 million. And the winner each Wednesday will receive $1 million. And so far, state officials say the lottery has been a huge success. This has been very successful. This past Friday was our highest vaccine administration day in three weeks. We were experiencing a 24% decrease week over week for those prior two Fridays. Last Friday, that age group saw a 6% increase. Since DeWine's announcement, several governors following suit to encourage residents to get the vaccine, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan also announcing a lottery with one grand winner to take home $40,000. You guys weren't expecting that one, were you? And New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announcing a $5 million grand prize as well. These types of incentives might just be the extra boost necessary for a country that rests on the brink of returning to a new normal. According to Dr. David Ash, a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, some rewards might work better than others. What I like about the system in Ohio is that it, it trades on emotion. It's very exciting. And I think Harnessing that kind of excitement towards this important social purpose is a really good idea. He says a transactional incentive like giving a direct monetary payment for getting the vaccine might potentially backfire. In creating a payment for something, you're saying, well, well why do I need to get paid? Maybe, maybe this could this could elevate concerns uh, that people already have. Uh, I'm not sure that's true for some of the other kinds of incentives like Ohio's sweepstakes-based incentive, which is largely focused on, you know, getting a big prize. Perks are, of course, only one of many reasons why people hesitant of getting a vaccine may ultimately decide to do so. A study conducted by the De Beaumont Foundation interviewing a group of people on the fence shows a desire to return to normal with their family and loved ones often marks the tipping point. Honestly, rather than there being a moment that I learned something, it was more like as time went on, the balance of, you know, things that I wanted and that I wanted for my daughter and I want to travel and I want to get back to normalcy, those things sort of started to tip the scale. And while vaccine hesitancy is certainly one huge challenge, equitable access to vaccines remains a stark barrier for many. For example, 37 percent of potentially undocumented Hispanic adults report they want a vaccine as soon as possible, but have yet to receive one. Many cited concerns such as the risk of having to miss work from side effects or the distance to the nearest vaccine site as to why they were unable to access the vaccine. With about 40% of American adults still yet to get their first dose, expanding access to vaccines and convincing those on the edges of getting one will be a critical task over the months to come. I want my child to go back. Now, in the beginning, I, you know, He's been in the virtual learning center, but I want him to be full speed with a teacher in his classes, you know, having that interaction, getting some of that one on one help. That is one concerned parent in Detroit where schools are reopening after a COVID spike in Michigan earlier this spring. But as schools open their doors, they're facing a pretty dire situation, which is a worsening teacher shortage. It's a precursor of what we could see all across the country come the fall. NBC News correspondent Heidi Presbola joins us now from outside Coleman Young Elementary School in Detroit's Upper West Side. Heidi, frankly, not enough teachers means that's a direct impact on students as well as attendance. So describe what's going on there in Detroit. Yeah, Morgan, very difficult circumstances that, frankly, were exacerbated by COVID. What we're seeing here as these doors swing open is chronic absenteeism. The increase in the number of students who are failing at least one course, up to about 57 percent of those who attend virtually. And then there's those students who just went missing entirely. Morgan, about 1,000 kindergartners who just never even logged on. Take a listen to this teacher who told us that the role he's had to play as a teacher over the past year felt like being in the FBI. 
Yes, a lot of kids just went dark. And that's where our wellness logs and our contact information came into play at. Uh, we had to actually, sometimes you have to physically drive to the student's house or set up different meetings with the children, with the families, uh, just staying connected. And Morgan, the principal of this school, Coleman Young Elementary School, was just out here moments ago. She told us there's an entirely new position at schools across the city, attendance agents huh. that are needed to track down these students and go to their home practically every day. Wow, an attendance agent. I've never heard of such a thing. I guess given that, what is the school district yeah, saying about filling those vacancies? I mean, what's the solution here? Are there any incentives, for example, being offered to bring teachers back into those classrooms? Lots of incentives. Just as of today, for instance, the superintendent of uh, Nikolai Viti increasing teacher salaries once again. They have a $750 bonus for any teacher that is staying in the class per quarter. But Morgan, here's what they're up against. Just in Michigan, we've seen since August an increase in retirements of 44 percent. We also have national statistics showing that the two lines between demand and supply are not coming together. They are diverging nationally, preceding what may be really a difficult fall for many school districts to get those qualified professionals who are the key to getting our students back on track. They want lower ratios. They want one-to-one -one or at least smaller groups working with these kids who've fallen the furthest behind, Morgan. That's so important right now. Heidi Preswell there in Detroit. Thank you so much, Heidi. And while the U.S. is rejoicing over the number of Americans who've gotten the vaccine, the country is still reopening and social distancing as restrictions are being lifted. But not everyone can take a sigh of relief just yet. In fact, early research shows that 15 to 80 percent of people with certain medical conditions are generating very few antibodies after receiving those covid vaccines. That's according to The Washington Post. Maria Hoffman is one of the millions of Americans the vaccine might not actually work for. Maria joins us now live. Maria, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day to be with us and explain this. And I, I wanted to do this story in part because you're sort of the face of who we still need to protect in this country. And if I can just lay out some of these statistics for our viewers as I introduce you, you're 39 years old, you are fully vaccinated, but you're also a kidney transplant patient. And that key, that part there is so key. So what steps are you taking, Maria, to ensure that you remain safe while these restrictions are being lifted? And, and how do you feel about mask mandates and those other restrictions kind of easing up? Um, yeah, first, thank you for the opportunity to um, speak out about it. Yeah, I am a kidney transplant recipient. Um, I actually just celebrated 30 years post-transplant, which... Congratulations. Um, thank you. It's um, just to put it out there, the average transplant um, organ survivor, I guess, is um, 12 to 15 years. And so I've completely obviously doubled the odds of that. Um, my wow. condition is, is a little bit even more complicated than that. Um, I've got a congenital anomaly of the kidney urinary tract, which is known as CACIT. And with that, kidney transplants usually last five to 10 years. So um, obviously getting the vaccine was a no brainer for me. Um, I actually had COVID back in the beginning wow. in uh, March of last year. And it, it wasn't a pretty, it wasn't a pretty situation. And I, you know, I'm at high risk for having it again. Not only is my transplant 30 years, but the kidney is older than that considering my donor wow. that donated um so yeah i've been vaccinated um i am continuing to take every precaution as if i wasn't vaccinated um i'm social distancing i continue to wash my hands the mask wearing um and just trying to stay it safe and that's why i think this is so important maria because i mean again you're you're who this country needs to protect and this is a virus that frankly we're probably going to be living with in some capacity in the in the foreseeable future so what can we do maria what can we do to help you what can the rest of us who don't have underlying conditions do and keep in mind really as we begin this this return to normalcy to help you yeah, I think the biggest thing is just to educate yourself. Everybody knows somebody that's high risk. You may not know a kidney transplant recipient, but you know somebody that's been affected by cancer, has had cancer, or is it, has cancer currently. Um, just because a cancer patient is, you know, being cancer free, they're still high risk. And I think that's one of the things that people don't understand. If you looked at me going down the street, you're not going to know that I had anything wrong with me, that I had a kidney transplant or I have underlying other conditions. 
conditions. I think it's just respecting everybody that you pass by. Um, you know, I can't make anybody wear a mask when mask mandates have been lifted. Um, but, you know, just being respectful and continuing to, so to social distance is, is going to do wonders itself. Yeah, um, that, just, that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And Maria, can I ask, you know, I mean, how is this transition back to normalcy different for you and people like you who are still in this high risk category? Um, it's been different because I am still on very high alert. Um, I haven't actually returned to the office. I've, I've had a, my employer has been great at allowing me to work from home um, for almost the last year and a half. Wow. Um, and I'm going to, I've been I'm going to be going back into the office soon. So, um, I, you know, I went up the other day, kind of looked at things and maneuvered things where I felt fit. Um, my office is being moved, um, to a back, you know, to a more secluded area to, you know, to keep me safe and to make me feel safe. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely different. Um, you know, I want to travel just like everybody else. I want to go to concerts just like everybody else, but I still am more cautious about it. Um, you know, for somebody with a high risk condition, socialization is a very important factor into their healthcare. You know, socialization is going to decrease the stress, which is going to help decrease blood pressure. Um, it's going to help with mental, mental health. So I think, you know, a lot of things that people don't realize, you know, we've heard it all. We've heard the, oh, they should just continue to quarantine themselves. You know, mm. that's mm. not necessarily the case. You know, it's a little bit different for us. It goes a little bit farther that it's just important for the high risk population, not just kidney transplant recipients to be able to get out and about and live their life as well. And Maria, I, we have to go now, but you mentioned mental health. And I think that's a really important point. You know, how does that feel? I, I notice on my Facebook feed and my Instagram feed, I see people with their, you know, <laughs> vaccinated girl summer posts and people are so excited, you know, t doing the boomerangs and taking off their masks. As someone who perhaps can't jump back into normalcy with the same, uh, you know, excitement and gumption that other people kind of have. How does that feel when you're seeing those posts and those celebrations? Does it feel differently for you? Yeah, it's disheartening. Um, you know, we live in a country right now where there's a lot of, you know, hatred and, you know, just disrespect. And I think if we all work together, we can all do so good for one another. And, um, you know, get everybody back to get back together and back to normalcy sooner. Back we just have together, to work together again. Maria Hoffman, thank you so much for sharing your experience thank with you. us. I think it is so important for us to remember that there are still uh, diverse populations who are experiencing this pandemic and even the end of it really differently. So thanks for sharing with thank us. You. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. We're talking earnings, consumer confidence, April's new home sales all on tap this week. Plus, a popular video platform also going public. Let's go ahead and go to CNBC correspondent Rahel Solomon, who's here to break it all down for us. Rahel, great to see you. Uh, earnings season is winding down, but we're still waiting on a few big names. So who exactly is reporting this week? Hey, Morgan. Yeah, nice to see you, too. So tomorrow we hear from Nordstrom, Urban Outfitters and home builder Toll Brothers Wednesday. Their shipmaker NVIDIA and Capri Holdings. That's the parent company of brands like Michael Kors and Jimmy Choo. Thursday, quite a few well-known names. Dow Component, Salesforce, Best Buy, HP, Costco, beauty retailer Ulta and The Gap. And then Big Lots reports before the bell on Friday. So, Morgan, in the last few weeks, we have heard from a slew of retailers Dillard in particular reporting a stellar quarter, the CEO highlighting increasing vaccinations, stimulus checks and warmer weather as reasons it saw sales increase even beyond 2019 levels. So we'll be watching to see if any of that carried over to some of the other retailers who are reporting this week. But uh, yeah, winding down, but still quite a quite a week ahead of us. Morgan. And, and speaking of that week ahead, Rahel, I mean, spring is typically a pretty hot time on the housing market. But this year, prices are high. The inventory is low. And then tomorrow, data on those new home sales for April are coming out Thursday, those pending home sales. So why are all of these numbers so important for us understanding the health of our economy? 
Yeah, well, Morgan, you already said it, right? The market has been hot. So depending on what we see this week, it may be a sign of any cooling in the market or if demand is just still just as hot, even with lower inventory on the market. So pending home sales, that measures contract sign. That's a considered uh, more of a leading indicator in real estate since homes go under contract a month or two before it's sold. So it leads existing home sales by a month or two. So again, uh, really just another indicator of whether people are still buying and they're are homes to buy because of lower inventory or if prices have maybe just gotten a little bit too hot. And Rahel, my last question for you, I know a platform that a lot of us journalists in the building use, Vimeo, uh, is going public on the NASDAQ tomorrow. What does that mean? What does, why does it matter? Yeah, so it's going public after being spun off by media mogul Barry Diller's firm, IAC. It's going to trade under the ticker VMEO. The company has about 1.6 million subscribers. Uh, the CEO of the company telling CNBC earlier this month it's just another beginning. IAC has also spun off other companies such as Match. Now, this is why it matters, Morgan. It's an indication that the company thinks that there's a, quite a significant appetite in the public markets for this stock. Companies do tend to hold off on going public when they don't think that it will be received well in the markets, as we know the markets have done pretty well as of late. And so uh, it appears that at least one company continues to think that there is still a healthy appetite in the markets for its listing. All right. We just got a crash course on financial literacy in the markets <laughs> there. Rahel, thanks so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Good to be with you. And speaking of social media, pro-Palestinian activists are hitting Facebook where it hurts. They're trying to target the social media giant by giving it one-star reviews in the Apple and Google app stores to protest what they claim is Facebook's censorship of Palestinian accounts and posts. Let's go ahead and bring in NBC News tech investigations editor Olivia Solong. Olivia, uh, thanks for being with us. The strategy, it, it frankly, seems to be working. I mean, I looked at Facebook's app designation just the other day, and it was only about two stars. So what can you tell us? I mean, what exactly are activists claiming that Facebook is censoring? So Facebook, Twitter and other social networks have for years been accused of censoring Palestinian voices by deleting pro-Palestinian posts and accounts, including those of journalists and activists. Um, but during this month's conflict between Hamas and Israel, Palestinians and their supporters have said this problem has intensified. So over a week ago, some of them started posting to social media calling on others to give Facebook these one-star reviews. And the campaign appears to have gone viral, leading to thousands of negative reviews on the app stores. And how is Facebook responding to all of this, Olivia? So according to leaked internal posts that I have seen, Facebook is really concerned about this. Um, internally, they've categorized the campaign as a severity one incident, which is a description they use when there's a major issue with the website. It's the second highest priority incident after severity zero, which is used when the website is completely down. There seems to have been some discussion among employees about whether they are, in fact, unfairly deleting pro-Palestinian content. But Facebook is also trying to contact the app stores to ask if they will remove the negative reviews. Well, speaking of those app stores, Olivia, has there been any word from, say, Apple or Google on all of this? Well, neither Apple nor Google responded to me when I asked them to comment on this issue. But I have seen leaked Facebook posts, which seem to show that Apple responded to Facebook saying it won't take down the negative reviews. Now, removing these reviews does kind of open up a can of worms for Apple and Google, as they don't currently spend all that much time policing reviews in their app stores. And doing so could even open those companies up to accusations of censorship. All right. Olivia Salom for us. Olivia, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. California Democrats do not have a backup plan if Governor Gavin Newsom loses his recall election. But NBC News senior digital politics reporter Alex Seitzwald says that party leaders actually want to keep it that way, even if it means forfeiting to Republicans. Alex is here joining me now. Alex, I, I got to ask you, I mean, why are party leaders working so hard to keep other Democrats off the ballot? Yeah, Morgan. So when voters head to the poll for this recall election in the fall, they're going to have two questions. Number one, should Governor Gavin Newsom be removed from office? And number two, if he is removed, who should replace him? And right now, there aren't really any, uh, you know, big name Democrats running, and that's the way they want to keep it. So it's only Republicans, only independents that you could choose from to be a replacement. The reason they're doing that 
is they think uh, that it will present this united front where all Democrats are on board together. They think if Democrats get in the race, it could lend legitimacy to the recall election. And they feel like Gavin Newsom is in a very strong position right now that he's likely to win on that first question. So it doesn't even really matter what happens on the second question. And that's all correct. The polls show that Gavin Newsom is way ahead. But, uh, you know, some Democrats and Republicans that I talked to, Republicans who don't particularly like Donald Trump, that is, they're concerned that, you know, if there is no backup plan, if there's no insurance policy, if he is recalled, then voters are going to be left choosing only amongst Republicans and independents. Uh, so there's some anxiety about this uh, in California right now. So as I understand it, you're saying the first question is, should Newsom be removed? The second is who should replace him. But one of Governor Newsom's senior advisors told you that every significant Democrat has endorsed the governor and opposes the recall. In fact, he said there's little interest or support for it beyond that hardcore Trumpian base. So there's little need for a plan B. But, Alex, you know, we're talking about the Democrats who empower. But what are Democratic voters on the ground saying about this strategy? Yeah, this is really interesting because the voters have a totally different view than their officials, you know, the kind of Democratic uh, Party strategists and poobahs. There was just a poll out of the University of California, Berkeley, that showed by a 48 to 29 percent margin, so there's almost double uh, among Democratic voters, that they actually want another option. So the voters say they would like more Democrats on the ballots, but the uh, officials say that, you know, it, it's not a, a good idea strategically at the moment. And basically the, what they're concerned about is you could split the Democratic uh, vote if this happened. And, and this did actually happen the last time there was a recall in 2003. The lieutenant governor got in the race. Uh, he explicitly ran on a on a call of being an insurance policy. His his slogan was vote no on the recall. Yes, on Bustamante. That was his name. Hmm. But if you're confused, so were a lot of California voters at the time. <laughs> and uh, the governor lost uh, and a Republican, Arnold Schwarzenegger, won. So uh, a lot of Democrats today still remember that and they don't want to repeat that. High drama there in California politics. Alex Seitzwald for us. Thank you so much, Alex. We appreciate you bringing us all that latest news. Thanks, Morgan. It's the election audit that never ends. Ballot counting resuming today in Maricopa County, Arizona, as county leaders threaten to sue the state Senate. NBC News political reporter Von Hillier joins me now. Uh, Vaughn, OK, let's let's go big picture here, because I feel like a lot of people can get, you know, lost in the weeds here. So, number one, yeah. why is this recount so important? And two, what's the delay about? Yeah, if we could, Morgan, I think it's hard to get lost in the weeds because there is a lot of allegations and a lot of suggestions that this uh, Maricopa County election was flawed. But there is nothing, no evidence to actually back up those claims. So it's very easy to get lost in the weeds because right now that's what they are. They're nothing but weeds. You ask the question, what is this delay? Well, this is the Arizona State Senate who called on contractors, hired contractors after they subpoenaed those county 2.1 million ballots to conduct this so-called audit. Well, there were things like high school graduations this last week that uh, had the building already preoccupied and in use. So they had to put on hold this counting, this so-called audit, uh, and wait for today, in which they have begun that process again. They are only 25 percent of the way through in their process, they say at this time, Morgan. Which is interesting because, you know, Vaughn, this audit has been the butt of a lot of jokes. It's been really controversial. But now there's this possible lawsuit against the Arizona State Senate. So why? Because this this is real, you know, and I think we can roll our eyes, shake our heads at uh, a lot of this, you know, seven months after the election ending. But there is a threat of a lawsuit from the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors to the state Senate and those contractors, because uh, over the course of these last three weeks, there's been suggestions uh, by these contractors and by this so-called audit, the folks running it, that there have been improprieties on the part of the county, even like suggesting that uh, voter databases were deleted. But that is not actually the case. That's not truth. That's not real. And I want to let you hear from Clint Hickman. He's one of those uh, supervisors on the Maricopa County Board who is a part of that letter to the state. And what's interesting to note is he voted for President Trump back in November. He was at his very last rally in Arizona. But you'll hear from him frustration because of the push of this big lie, if you may. Take a listen. To see their facility have graduations and they pick up and move the ballots to somewhere 
Then they, then they bring them back. Then the machinery leaves. And I don't know if we even see the machinery on camera anymore. Um, it just, it's just troubling. It's, it's just not the way the county does business for its, uh, its citizens. Morgan, objectively, there has been very little transparency. And again, Republican County Board of Supervisors there. There are serious questions as to who is funding this and who is actually these audit folks that are running the show and the ones supposedly counting these ballots. You know, Hickman told me, he said, this is a bridge to nowhere. Yet the question is, how far does that bridge go? Because every time a new narrative is brought up, it's debunked. But that hasn't stopped the folks running this audit from bringing up new allegations just to then get debunked again. Again, 25% of the way through this audit, so-called audit, they say, so we still have potentially weeks or months to go unless a court were to bring this to an end, Morgan. All right, Von Hilliard for us, watching and following that road, uh, no matter how long it is. All right, Von, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, my friend. The Summer Olympics starts in just two months, and gymnast Simone Biles is already vaulting into the record books, making history this weekend in her first competition since 2019. Today's show co-host Chanel Jones has her story. Time. Here we go. Simone Biles is back, and once again, she's making history. Wow. Sporting a litard decorated with a rhinestone goat signifying greatest of all time, the five-time Olympic medalist landed the hardest vault in women's Political gymnastics, gymnastics history, a Yurchenko double pike. Huge air. That is becoming the first woman ever to do it in a competition. The highly difficult skill combines a round off, back handspring, and piked double backflip in the air. I was just thinking, do it like training. It's a new vault, and I'm proud of how today went. The move catching the attention of LeBron James and former First Lady Michelle Obama, who tweeted, keep shining, we're rooting for you. Despite some struggles later on the uneven bars, the 24-year-old Olympian placed first overall, successfully defending her GK U.S. Classic all-around title. But while it was a return to the podium for Biles, for 32-year-old Chelsea Mimmel, it was an inspiring return to the sport. The former world all-around champion and 2008 Olympics Games silver medalist, now mother of two, coming out of retirement after nine years to perform a full twisting Yurchenko on the vault. I just wanted to put that message out to to anybody who thought they missed their chance at something. No one should be stopping you. Just just don't hold yourself back. Memo documenting her comeback on YouTube, working to change the way the world and the sport sees elite gymnasts, including Biles, whose barrier breaking moves prove women in the sport can peak well beyond their teenage years. She recently talked with Hoda about age. Do you think about your age? girl all the time. The kids remind me how old I am every day. And now on the final stretch to the Olympic Games, Simone Biles is already showing the world she is getting ready to soar. Well, the queen has definitely spoken. <laughs> hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.